Yeah, lovely. Okay, if, if anyone wants me to pause at any time, I can do. Uh, so we're moving into the last um, uh, panel of the conference. And traditionally, if we were all face to face, this is when you'd start seeing people putting their coats on and uh, leaving, or you'd have the, the coffee bits. But I often find that the end of the conference is when the really interesting stuff comes forward, because it's when people have had time to think and um, debate and consider the discussions before. So um, I'm hopeful that there's going to be uh, plenty of scope for um, some interesting discussion. Uh, on our panel today, we've got an out. Jolene, have I pronounced it right? Um, it's Yuleen. Yuleen, Yuleen, lovely. Uh, okay. Is a boy. <laughs> I could never be a BBC presenter. My pronunciation's terrible. Um, Yuleen. Okay, that's lovely. Um, Tobias, is Tobias here? Uh, not, not yet. Okay, so hopefully Tobias is making his way. Nick, we haven't heard anything from Tobias, have we? Uh, no, no, we have. Um, I think he's stuck in the attendees room again. Um, but I, <laughs> which has been our arch nemesis, hasn't it? This thing. Yes. Uh, yeah. Hey. Um, Hello, oh, Hi. Yeah, I was as a participant, not as a panelist or something like that. Sorry for yes, that. Yes, I'm sorry. I hope you're feeling better. Yeah, better at least. <laughs> Thank <Okay>. you. <laughs> Good. Uh, uh, and then we've got David. Hi, David. Nice to see you. And Paul. So we're all okay to go in that in the order that's on the um, agenda, yeah? Okay, then uh, we will start. I think uh, again, um, there's one, there's four of you. So I'll I'll work on the ten minutes. We'll try and keep quite strict to the ten minutes. We'll see how it goes. Um, um, but let's aim for that. So, um, Yulene, would you like to start? And I don't know if you'd like to share your screen, you're, you're welcome to, or if, if you haven't got PowerPoint slides, just fire away. That's fine. So um, I teach international relations at the University of the Western Cape in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, the paper that I'm presenting today is, uh, I actually wrote it in 2017 for an Isidaco summer school in Cyprus. And it's one of those papers that uh, has been in the drawer and then it comes out and I try to rework it into an article and I put it back in the drawer. You know, it's just not somehow going anywhere. So I thought this would be the last ditch attempt to do something with it and present it here, maybe get some feedback that would uh, set a course for, for actually reworking it into something that's useful and that can be published. So what I argue in this paper, is that outlawing nuclear weapons should be placed in the context of outlawing war. Um, as you know, the discursive history of the TPNW is that of the humanitarian initiative, uh, which roots the argument for banning nuclear weapons in use in Bello, um, so what is legal in war or international humanitarian law, rather than use at bellum or when it is legal to go to war. And this move from the nuclear abolition movement um, may have been the most logical and direct way to achieve a ban treaty of this sort. Uh, it definitely worked for chemical and biological weapons, as well as for anti-personnel landmines and cluster music, uh, munitions. Um, and it also closes the loophole that the 1996 um, International Court of Justice judgment on the legality of nuclear weapons left, namely that extreme self-defense and state survival may justify the use or threat of use of nuclear weapons in the conduct of war. So states could use the ICJ's opinion to retain or obtain nuclear weapons, but the TPNW does not leave room for any such an in interpretation. So nuclear weapons um, are illegal in all respects, no causes barely can justify the use or threat of use in war, and therefore no causes belly necessitates their possession or existence for that matter. However, the humanitarian law justification for banning nuclear weapons run up against the idea that nuclear weapons are essential to deter wars in general and nuclear war in particular. So this idea of a nuclear peace some states have used this justification for not taking part in the ban treaty negotiations and some pundits have labeled the treaty a danger to international peace and security for the same reason. Discursively, therefore, I argue to promote the ban, 
the treaty must be contextualized in a broader set of arguments that reject the idea that nuclear weapons keep the peace. Now, one way to do so is to proffer arguments against deterrence theory, that deterrence is immoral, inhumane, unfair, fallible, um, leads to arms races, is being undermined by nuclear armed states own policies, for example, developing missile defenses um, and hypersonic deliver delivery vehicles and so forth. But the other way is to argue that war has been outlawed and that the decline we see in aggressive interstate war is the result of a normative shift in how international order is constituted. Banning nuclear weapons is therefore not simply an issue of not using or threatening to use uh, this massively destructive and indiscriminate, indiscriminate weapon in war, but an important step in rejecting wars of aggression as national policy. So by contextualizing the ban in the outlawing of war, my aim is not to detract from the treaty's humanitarian foundations, but to expand them so as to deal with this critique against the treaty that capitalizes on the discursive loopholes that a use in, in Bellow approach has left. Now, I do this by drawing on work that has been done on, this, on the Kellogg Beyond Pact, um, more formally, uh, the, it's called the General Treaty for Renunciation of War as an Instrument of National Policy. Um, it's also referred to as the Paris Peace Treaty, and I will use this denomination in the paper, um, which was negotiated in 1928. Um, I especially draw on the work of Hathaway and Shapiro, although these are not the only work. Um, that revises the impact of the Paris Peace Treaty. Um, I'm referring specifically to their book, The Internationalists, and they plan to outlaw war, um, which was published in 2017. And what they argue is that the Paris Peace Treaty ushered in a new world order based on the illegitimacy rather than the legitimacy of war. Um, the, Paris Peace Treaty represents a psychological slip shift in how people thought about war and the outlawry movement that unfolded in this treaty saw wars and aberration that needs justification, including in international law. So after 1928, states no longer have an unquestioned right to pre prepare for um, or threaten or conduct war as they did before. Instead, they have an obligation to circumvent war and to find alternatives to resolve disputes um, or exert their rights. Um, this psychological shift in the role of war was embraced at the Yalta Conference, where the Allies negotiated the setup of the United Nations. Um, and the UN was seen to provide the machinery to organize the peace that the Paris Peace Treaty lacked in 1928. And um, the UN Charter supersedes the Paris Peace Treaty, but the latter normatively informed the structures and procedures of the United Nations. So against this backdrop, I want to explore what discursive benefits the argument has that aggressive war as a constitutive premise of international society has been outlawed for the way we think about nuclear weapons and the TPNW as an effort to outlaw them. Um, in other words, how can it help the ban treaty supporters to think about nuclear weapons and use ad bellum if we take the outlawing of war and the new legal order that it brought about as the explicit political context that the TPNW is born into. And I could think of five ways in which such a contextualization can help the TPNW. The first is um, that thinking the two outlawing efforts together helps dismiss the charge that the TPNW is dangerous because nuclear weapons keep the peace. 
it does this by providing a plausible alternative explanation for why aggressive wars have declined, namely that war has been outlawed and a system of international institutions has been created to stigmatize aggression and to support peaceful resolution of disputes. Secondly, the idea of a nuclear peace does not share the current world order's normative underpinnings to resolve disputes peacefully. Rather, nuclear deterrence reifies aggressive war by its very premise. And I think here it relates to what Lyndon was saying. So it's aggressively keeping the peace. The absence of war or negative peace proposed under nuclear deterrence is a form of unresolved conflict with much the same psychological policy and economic effects as being at war. Nuclear deterrence may even prolong or intensify international disputes as have arguably been the case in political hotspots like the Middle East, the Korean Peninsula, and even between India and Pakistan. Um, so it was not by chance that one of the first acts towards political reconciliation in South Africa and a peaceful end to apartheid and rejoining the international community um, was F.W. de Klerk's decision to dismantle apartheid South Africa's nuclear weapons. The third uh, point that I want to make about how thinking these two outlawing efforts together can help the TPNW is that in contrast to nuclear deterrence, outlawing war favors positive peace. So what uh, Galtung describes as the integration of human society. The Paris Peace Treaty as the trigger of a new world order where war is illegal and the UN Charter as consolidating this order of positive peace measures. In the long run, positive peace measures build international society on a balance between national self-interest and pro-social values of cooperation and mutual benefit. The peace is organized, to use Brian's term, not by the idea that a technology, nuclear weapons, in the hands of some chosen ones act as a leviathan on the international stage and frightens off war, but by pro-social or humanitarian values embodied in international law. So peace is not a byproduct of terror and fear that a massively destructive weapon will be used in wars. Peace is the result of a community of states that have concluded that war can and should be avoided through renouncing it and engaging in peaceful resolution of disputes. Um, we can think of the Latin adage, um, if you see this pacem, para pacem, you know, if you want peace, prepare for peace. Um, and then the fourth point, thinking about the nuclear ban in terms of outlawing war also helps to refocus us on the original intent of the NPT, namely achieving non-proliferation. We have two minutes. Thank you. To keep nuclear disarmament negotiations viable. A uh, popular interpretation of the NPT is that it legitimizes uh, five states' nuclear weapons, and these states become by default keepers of the nuclear peace, as if other states have appointed them as these nuclear leviathans by signing on to the NPT. And for many states, this is a misrepresentation. Um, in the paper, I point to at least two occasions that illustrate how nuclear deterrence, in fact, enables international aggression as national policy in contradiction of use of um, the two cases, the, the 2003 Iraq war and also Russia's annexation of Crimea. And then lastly, and I'll end with this, um, Outlawing of war does not take away states' right to self-defense, but circumscribes war to self-defense. The idea that nuclear weapons keep peace confuses the right to self-defense with a right to punish aggression through nuclear retaliation. The systems system set up by the United Nations 
to achieve peace, whether that's the UN Security Council, um, mediation, sanctions as a deterrent to aggression, collective security, etc., is sidelined and undermined by nuclear deterrence. So when nuclear weapons are off the table, these instruments are back in play and I'll, I'll end here. It's lovely. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, some very interesting points there. Let's let's hope we can sort of come back to those. Great. Uh, Tobias. 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 Hi. <laughs> Hi. 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 Um, Hi. You're welcome to share your screen if you want to, or if you've just got um, uh, slides, just um, so if you haven't got slides and just uh, crack away with the presentation. Uh, as I said to the others, it's about 10 minutes for each presentation and two minutes beforehand, I'll just let you know. Okay. Great, thank you so much, Patricia and, and, and Nicola, and thank you everyone um, for organizing this conference uh, and also for, for inviting me and, and having a, a presentation uh, of, a, of a paper. Um, Really, thank you very much. I think it's really, really timely, really great. And at the same time, with the thank you also, uh, my, my really my apologies. I apologize for only jumping in now. I, I, I got COVID despite vaccination and, and it led to pretty bad headache and sleeping a lot and all that. Um, but again, so, 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 so thank you very much. Um, reassessing. You know, I, I meant to say, sorry, I, I'm, apologies. I, I took it for granted that other members had been here um, before, but um, I just asked um, people that are presenting if they can just say a little bit about themselves. Um, so if you if you can, just before you start, if you can just let us know just a little bit about you know, where you're working as an introduction, um, that would be helpful. I'm sorry to interrupt you, and I'm, I'm really glad that you're feeling better. <laughs> No, no sure thing and you're the boss so 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 i'm gonna <laughs> stick to that and also to the to the to the 10 minutes keep it brief uh no so tobias fessner I'm, I'm head of the security and law uh, program at the geneva center for security policy um so so we're doing kind of three things um typically in an academic or think tankish manner uh, on the one hand research on the other hand organize uh, conferences like these and on the other hand uh third um uh, teaching uh, and and for us it's it's mostly executive education so 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 mid-career uh, professionals and being at the heart of um, being in Geneva, well, we, we we also consult and advise and try to maybe yeah bring 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 good ideas or thoughts into diplomatic processes, especially multilateral uh, uh, processes in the in the security uh, field. So 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 that um, uh, to me. And 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 as I said, really really help, uh, grateful to, to be here and um, reassessing the key debates. I think it's really really great theme. And and so, so I'm coming most I'm coming for the IR, but also doing a lot of legal stuff. So um, really focusing on on the legal and normative aspects. And this, of course, in the realm of, of nuclear weapons, uh, we're we're thinking mostly in terms of TPNW, as has been already said um, before. Now here with the TPNW. Um, the, the general ex explanation of the effect, uh, but also of the rationale of, of the TPNW, and I think you're, you're all really, really uh, familiar with that, is really that the TPNW uh, codifies, creates, enhances, and helps disseminate uh, norms against nuclear nuclear weapons. And this is how the treaty was, was, was designed, was created, um, and also how it's really now explained, and both in the theoretical uh, literature uh, but also in the diplomatic uh, discourse um, and, 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 and among practitioners, including including uh, critiques uh, that are saying that this normative enterprise may, may not work as intended, et cetera, et cetera. But the focus is really on, on how the TPNW uh, fosters uh, norms against nuclear weapons. Now, now this in general is, is based on the assumption that the fact that the TPNW is a, an international treaty, but under international law, actually does this is not that important, or 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 maybe even actually that fact helps um, this this normative enterprise, and and this assumption generally is not outspoken or or not really explicitly said, um, maybe because a lot of IR scholars don't think it's such a big di di difference between treaty law, and soft law, or, or political binding instruments, maybe because the lawyers. Um, they like to, to, to focus on the nitty gritties of, 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 of the law and not so much about, about, about the bigger questions. I, I, I don't know, but at least it's, it's a general assumption out there. I think my point here would be that 
there is actually a point that the TPNW is a treaty under international law, a formal treaty. So that does have an effect on how it works. And the, the argument that I'm making in the paper is that the treaty actually allows to signal, um, so, so it allows to, 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 to serve as a signaling device um, from the, the states that have adhered to the treaty to the states that have not adhered um, to, to the treaty. So I'm not saying that um, the, the normative enterprise is, is not working or is, not, is wrong or, or, or whatever. Um, I, I see this basically as, as more as a, as a secondary uh, or, or, or just a, a second uh, a mechanism that is at play, but that does not necessarily have to be a mutually um, exclusive. So basically the paper uh, develops how, how treaty law uh, enables signaling to, to, to outsiders. And so signaling um, in general is a concept that it, that is used uh, between between states, um, also uh, especially in, in international uh, security um, affairs. Uh, in the context of treaty law, it has been been developed and applied already. Um, and here, basically, the, the the major focus is is to say that uh, when states uh, sign an international treaty or adhere to to an international treaty, they signal a commitment. Um, and so that's how the the signaling mechanism is applied and of course also if you have costly signals um, that actually helps to distinguish uh, between states that are very likely uh, or more likely to comply with the given treaty uh, regime and those that have less costly signals it's 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 less good uh, indication about if they're going to comply or 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 not and so so based on this um i i, I develop how how the signaling, how the treaty law a regime per se now allows a signaling to outsiders, so to those states that have not adhered. And the mechanisms are, um, there are different mechanisms at play. So the first one is treaty gives uh, visibility. So the entire um, process, negotiation process, um, that, that gives you a certain visibility. The fact that to the treaty um, states or even in the public, um, it, it is being discussed, it's been um, noticed. A second one is that um, of the mechanisms, the treaty screens between insiders and outsiders. So through the ratification process, et cetera, et cetera, there's a clear, then you can really identify which states have adhered and which states have not. And then you have the UN treaty database, et cetera, et cetera. So that makes you very easily accessible which states are on which, which side. Then another one is that the treaty allows precise uh, definition of, of the substance of the message that you want to signal um, and states are, are particularly careful when, when drafting international treaties there's also established treaty language um, that that helps you also that there are interpretation methods um, this helps you to better understand the message define the message but also understand the message and the last point is uh, that treaty um, a treaty regime gives a certain level of credibility uh, to the treaty, which, which is important to signaling, but of course, only a certain level. Uh, this is limited, especially if, 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 it's, um, if the costs are not so high for states to adhere to the treaty regime. Although, uh, nonetheless, the very fact that you're bound to this treaty regime uh, gives a certain credibility because there are some costs associated because you cannot uh, easily uh, back down or, or, or withdraw from, from, from a treaty. So this is basically the, the theoretical uh, foundation um, to, to which then uh, can be um, applied to the TPNW. And for the TPNW uh, here to, 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 to keep it short, to give the, the, the major uh, uh, elements, but then also um, then maybe in the discussions we can, we can build on that. I'm pretty sure that others um, have, have important points here. Well, the first point that it does in that sense is really that, as we said, there's visibility, et cetera, um, but it really brings legal uh, division between states that have adhered to, to the treaty and those that have not. Now here, um, we all know there, there's not much new under the sun or no, no big surprises. Um, those that have adhered are mostly non-nuclear weapon states, um, oftentimes uh, those also that are, are members of global, I'm sorry, of uh, nuclear weapon free zones. Uh, the nuclear weapon states are outside, umbrella states uh, are remaining outside and, and, and some others. Uh, but what it really does now, it gives this, this clear signaling, um, uh, sorry, this clear screening 
um, that, that allows us to assess which states are, are, are where, but also from a legal perspective, um, it, it makes it very clear, um, and, and Jolene has, has mentioned that before, um, that those states that have adhered, uh, for them, this is uh, nuclear weapons are, 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 are illegal. Um, for those that who have not adhered, um, they, it makes it a bit harder to, to say that, well, the international law is not clear. So, so you might even make uh, the argument that, that you, you cannot be indecisive anymore if you're not adhering to the treaty. So basically you're endorsing uh, that nuclear weapons are legal. And I'm thinking here, especially for instance, um, like, like Switzerland, when, when you ask them, um, I, I know them pretty well, do you think nuclear weapons are, are, are legitimate? They're going to say, no, they're not legitimate. They're more or less like, or do you think they're legal? Yeah, that's a bit complicated, you know. Uh, they're not legal, but they're also not illegal. I think this case is is, is really really hard to make um, because if you're saying that they're illegal, well, why don't you adhere to to the treaty? And the treaty is, is, is pretty clear on that. So I think that's uh, a legal division that the treaty, uh, in that sense, uh, uh, brings. But then the question, well, what what does it signal? And and if you're thinking of signaling, well. What, what does it say? So in that sense, what are what are the messages? Um, I, I identify four um, messages. Uh, many of you, uh, 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 they sound familiar to you or they, they know them. I think, first of all, messages that nuclear weapons are illegal. That's, that's clear, that's the goal of the treaty. Um, second uh, is that nuclear weapons are immoral. I think that, that's also clear. Uh, third one, that they're dangerous. Um, risk of escalation, humanitarian disasters, etc. And the fourth, that disarmament, uh, nuclear disarmament should advance, that the status quo um, and, and, and is, is not acceptable. So those are, those are the four messages. Now, in terms, in the paper, I, I developed more specifically um, how the fact that it is a treaty on international law supports these messages or not. Um, and I think the, the most important factor, however, the most important message overall is then really that states clearly, clearly signal that they do not want to do anything um, uh, with, with, with uh, they, they want nothing to do with nuclear weapons. So they clearly also signal that they want other states also to not have anything to do uh, with nuclear weapons, but through the mechanisms of international law, where every state is sovereign, every state uh, uh, can only uh, commit for in its own behalf, so cannot really extend any legal obligations on others. Uh, that, thank you. That means that that the most important message is really um, that that we do not want anything to do with, with nuclear weapons. And that, as a consequence, leads to the question, well, if the TPNW actually is something similar, like a global uh, non-weapon, uh, non-nuclear weapons-free zone, nuclear weapons-free zone, um, and here, the reason is because this signaling, this messaging, is pretty similar to 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 nuclear, um, to to uh, nuclear weapon free zone treaties, uh, and 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 in that sense, could have uh, or has has a similar uh, effect. I think I'm going to leave it up to to David uh, Morales to develop this more. I think uh, he has certainly more interesting and more developed thoughts on this. Um, but I think that's kind of a logic coming out of this the the, the, the signaling. And so to, to end, um, in that sense, that would be the theoretical uh, proposition that how um, uh, and, and kind of this reassessing uh, a key debates uh, in the nuclear field, I think this is a theoretical proposition to see, okay, uh, is there something like signaling from, from treaty regime to outsiders and how the TPNW does that? Um, but also from a, from a, from a practical uh, perspective and political perspective, I think it is obvious that the TPNW has brought a lot of division um, I think it's also uh, clear that this uh, was intended. Um, but to me, the, the question is a bit, and this is especially when I'm listening to, to a lot of debates in Geneva, um, th the question is if, 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 if this is a step forward or, or, or if it's maybe at one point, um, it, it, it would be interesting to try to bridge the divisions uh, and bridge the, the divides and, and, and rather than, than, than being confrontational. Um, and in any case, if you're looking at uh, the TPNW as, as a signaling device, I think uh, that would kind of actually uh, enable uh, the floor for, 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 for something like this, because it appears actually much, much less threatening uh, than oftentimes it is uh, uh, depicted. So again, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And, and thank you.
Brilliant, lovely, thank you. Another really interesting uh, presentation, thank you. Okay, so we move on to David, and again, David, um, uh, welcome to share your screen if you've got slides, or if you have no slides, just fire away. And if you could please just let everyone have a little introduction um, uh, about you, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Patricia. Thank you, Nicola for the organization of this event. Good morning, everybody, okay? Well, good afternoon. <clears throat> I would like to thank the opportunity to talk about this short presentation that is a part of my postdoctoral research that is in the beginning stage. Uh, let me introduce myself, yes. I am David Morales. I'm professor of international relations at the Federal University of ABC in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And I am visiting research fellow at King's College, uh, Department of War Studies, uh, in a postdoctoral research uh, on the new proposals of nuclear weapons free zones. My tutor is Professor Wim Bowen, and I have a scholarship from the National Council for Scientific and Technological Development, uh, Saint Piqui, Brazil. Okay, the title of this this uh, paper is the impacts of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons for 21st century international sec uh, nuclear security and its contributions to the nuclear weapons free zones. Uh, the first multilateral treaty to ban nuclear weapons, TPNW, came into force in January, 2021. The, uh, this agreement was approved at the United Nations Assembly in 2017 when 122 countries adopted this new international regime that prohibits the production, storage, and transference of nuclear weapons. Currently, no nuclear armed countries have signed the treaty, nor have most European countries, notably those that are covered by the NATO system. Therefore, we can identify three relevant points in the following analysis. Firstly, it is necessary to verify what the TPNW means to international security as it enters into force as the first global agreement that explicitly prohibits nuclear weapons and their total elimination. Second, it is important to identify the possible effects of the TPNW to nuclear security and to other pre-existing agreements dealing with nuclear disarmament, principally the non-proliferation treaty. Third, we, can to shape, we have to shape the real impacts that the TPNW represents to regional security mechanisms, especially to the nuclear weapons free zones regime. Okay. Uh, first of all, we can consider the TPNW as the culmination of a worldwide movement to draw attention to the catastrophic humanitarian consequence of any use of nuclear weapons. It represents a meaningful commitment towards the total elimination of nuclear weapons, which remains the highest disarmament priority of the United Nations. This is why for the United Nations, the TPNW is a new chapter for nuclear disarmament. After decades of activism, the humanity has achieved what many said was impossible. Nuclear weapons could be banned. By the way, we can't generalize that this agreement that pretends to be global has an effect of, on countries that have not signed it. In this case, we are talking about countries that are currently not obliged to comply with the TPNW content. However, it is also not possible to reduce the significant force made for the approval of the global agreement in the United Nations Assembly. The MPT focuses only on the prohibition of the proliferation, but the TPNW complements the NPT by prohibiting the possession of nuclear weapons. However, the TPNW has its limitations. 
of course. It prohibits nuclear weapons, but it does not open space to discuss new mechanisms to the reduction of current and potential geopolitical threats that will encourage the few countries that possess nuclear arsenals to keep their stocks ready for attack. Secondly, there is a risk that TPNW might jeopardize the NPT's objective of verification requirements. There is a possibility that non-nuclear weapons stage may join the TPNW and choose to leave from the NPT and thus be free from the verification procedures. This concern is addressed by the TPNW, which requires member states to maintain the safeguards of the International Atomic Energy Agency without prejudice to any additional relevant instruments. It is possible that some countries might decide to withdraw from the NPT. Another problem is that TPNW didn't establish a highest standard for non-proliferation verification. The agreement does not apply to not nuclear weapons states to accept the model additional protocol to the International Atomic Energy Agency comprehensive safeguards. Instead, the treaty sets only the International Atomic Energy Agency comprehensive safeguards agreement as the minimum non-proliferation verification requirement. This is an outdated system that has been known for about 25 years to be inadequate to the challenge of routine or clandestine nuclear activity. In third place, in each one of the nuclear weapons free zones, non-nuclear states agreed not to receive transfer, manufacture, or acquire nuclear weapons. Also, nuclear states agreed not to transfer nuclear weapons to them, or otherwise assist or encourage non-nuclear weapons states to acquire nuclear weapons. This is a double compromise between nuclearized and non-nuclearized states into the nuclear weapons free zones agreements. We have five nuclear weapons free zones recognized by the United Nations, Latin America, Treaty of Tatelolco, Africa, Treaty of Pelindaba, South Pacific, Treaty of Rarotonga, South Asia, Treaty of Bangkok, and Central Asia, Treaty of Semipalatinsk, and Mongolia. In every one of these zones, there are specific protocols directed to the nuclear states it is assumed that this status will respect of a nuclear free zone and the commitment not to test nuclear bombs there. This is the main difference in comparing nuclear weapons free zone with the TPNW. While there are direct commitments in the nuclear weapons free zone, there is still no formal commitment in the TPNW and later being a global treaty while the nuclear weapons prisons are regional only. In conclusion, the TPNW and nuclear weapons prisons embody admirable goals for eradicating nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, at this time, the TPNW is only symbolic because the nuclear states have not signed it yet. Something similar has occurred with the 25 year old complete test ban treaty, CTBT, which is still waiting to be enforced. This is not exactly what happens with the nuclear weapons free zones because there are commitments and signed protocols from the nuclear states to each zone, to everyone. In this case, the nuclear weapons free zones could promote a comprehensive and gradual global denuclearization and join 
with the TPNW and CTBT to form a triad, targeting an effective strategy to establish an international regime with four. Okay, this is all. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Excellent timing and some really interesting points again. Thank you very much. You. Great. So uh, we're doing very well for time. We move on to um, Paul. Uh, are you um, are you okay? Everything ready? I don't know. I'm trying. Okay. Is that not coming up? Um, no. What you need oh, to do is oh. we click share screen. Yeah, I've done that. And then when you when you see the screen, you need to click on your presentation on your screen. There we are. We are. Yeah. We've done that. Okay. Um, okay. Full okay. disclosure. Um, I. Uh, I, I was the director of arms control for the Defence Ministry of a Nuclear Weapons State for several years, and I was a UN disarmament commissioner. And I have seen um, the problem of disarmament close up, and it ain't that pretty at all. And in addition, I uh, unusually, professionally unusually, I have been a was a group psychotherapist for about 13 years. So I'm quite interested in the psychological and cultural dimensions. Um, I'm not going to get presumptuously psychoanalytic, but I, th this seems to me an important way of relativizing who we are, what we're talking about, where there might be blind spots. And I'm, of course, struck by uh, the, the fact we uh, this is a tiny uh, discussion amongst um, specialists. And what I'm going to say is a ghetto within that tiny discussion. And so let's keep that in mind. And I think that's, that's interesting. What, why, why is, what are the implications of this being such a minority issue, even though we think that the whole uh, question is enormously important? So I'm going to give you a trigger warning, because this is obviously a, a safe space that some people would like to have. I'm, I'm going to question a lot of the things which have been said unapologetically. Um, I think it's uh, I, I don't think the ban treaty can achieve what it turns out to be. I'll try and explain why. And I don't, I don't think nuclear governments will think that it will. I'm not insistent there will always be nuclear weapons. I just don't see any good way out from the, nuclear, the, the Hotel California. Um, I want to provoke, I don't want to just get up your nose. I want to hear um, substantive rebuttals of what I'm going to say. Um, because when I presented similar ideas previously, I get this kind of pain silence uh, at the end, uh, and, my, and my desire to wrestle intellectually just gets ignored. Don't know, this, is, this is distasteful, don't want to deal with that. I'm also going to try and, because the debate's got so cliched and repetitive, I'm trying to introduce new, new terminology. Um, and, but I also, I want to argue, but I also sense from my own experience and ob observing these processes for about 20 years, uh, and, and reading as a pretend academic um, and, and former therapist, I don't think that rationality plays such a huge uh, part in all this. Um, uh, and final point, my, my, my lived truth is that I was involved in disarmament in the honeymoon period after the post-Cold War. I, I was deeply involved in various negotiations. There's a part of the Chemical Weapons Convention which will be ever, ever mine. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. So I, my, my experience my, as, as an adult and professional is seeing the collapse of those multilateral, multilateral hopes after the, um, the return of, of great power politics. I'm going to talk fast and break illusions. I've written quite a lot. There won't be time to read it. Um, you see, see things on the screen. I will send uh, anyone who, who, who wants it the, these de fairly detailed notes. So it, my point is we don't yet know what the TPNW is. It's the significance is in dispute. Um, I have no, I known people who said it's not worth, uh, and this is a supporter saying it's not worth trying to get seriously analytical. That's tearing the wings off a butterfly. This is all we could do. Um, and we're going to go on doing it. Um, and for some, I think it's it's just a cloak for what they would have wanted to do anyway. But I I read the proposition as this: it's 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 it's, it's conditional because we know we can, uh, or, or we believe we can, press for complete nuclear uh, nuclear abolition by diplomacy, every, everything else, um, campaigning. We will go on driving towards uh, a, an indispensable end state, complete, verified, irreversible nuclear disarmament. So therefore, it's morally obligatory to support that project. You've got to join us in pressing the, the, these um, 
morally reprehensible nuclear armed governments and alliances to give up their positions. But that, of course, didn't persuade the nuclear states, as everyone predicted it wouldn't. So what I see now, um, and so I'm using this sort of blue uh, font to indicate relatively new terminology, what we have now is not persuasion, we have suasion, which I looked up, and it's um, everything you do for persuasion, but with other kinds of pressures. And I take those to be disarmament, diplomacy, stigmatization, whatever that means, um, domestic political lobbying, disinvestment, potential economic boycotts, legal measures from treaty signatories. That, that is what's sort of threatened in the um, ICANN uh, um, uh, manifestos. And this will change the world. Uh, but it, we should note that partial or irreversible success leaves us still nuclear, but maybe more dangerous world. So this has got to be an all or nothing um, project really to get people to, to join up. I suggest that we could look at the plausibility of this promise, this kind of Pascalian wager, should we, should we leap to believe uh, in this, by the sort of JIC test. Every country has its National Intelligence Committee, it makes assessments of what's happening in the world. Um, I have once or twice sat on the British JIC, um, uh, and I've, I have a sense of how these discussions are conducted. And I, I, so I asked this question, knowing what the JICs in all countries know, um, what is there about the, the world situation which would lead you to believe that the TPNW's uh, project is achievable? And I, 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 I modestly attempt an outline, psychocultural strategic audit and net assessment. Um, this is too long and depressing, a whole list of dead acronyms of treaties, beginning with Versailles, which have been profoundly broken and breached. Um, I, I stress the Chemical Weapons Convention, because I think it was, not because I worked on it, because I think it was a leading edge for what the uh, a ban treaty would be, and it's, it, it's, it's being jammed. We can see that it doesn't work when a, um, a, a, a Security Council member with attitude and resources wants to block it. Um, and I think it's worth mentioning the Budapest Memorandum, because we have at the moment uh, a state which had denuclearized, given security guarantees, now being under attack from a nuclear state, which was one of those who gave the uh, guarantees. And this in Europe, and this with major nuclear overtones. And so I have this concept of treaty regime for fragilities. I think foreign militaries and intelligence agencies have it. Uh, I, I'm left seared with it, but I don't notice any uh, such awareness in the statements of TP, TPNW supporters. Somehow this thing is going to be reliable and self-maintaining. Uh, but okay, the, the, the assumption seems to be now, this time will be different. It will be irreversibly different, safely. And why is that? Well, because its supporters want it to be so much. Um, maybe there's more to it, but we, we'll, we'll, we can get to that. And I, and I think if we look at observable international behaviors, I see this this disjunction between ever-evolving idealized discourse within the disarmament archipelago, maybe disarmament acad academic archipelago, which we've, some of which we've heard today very eloquently, and a complete split between that and the actual <laughs> strategic, strategic behaviors. The, the, the weaponization of everything, background nuclear balance is actually being rather important, very little sign of stigmatization of how that's working out in Europe, Though I think, I think if you're a Ukrainian, you're feeling quite bitter about that. And then we get more, we're getting actual increases in nuclear weapons programs, et cetera, um, and modernization, exotic weapons, all of that. And you get characteristic intimidatory Russian, nuclear backed Russian behavior. So now even the German Greens are supporting renewed collective nuclear deterrence. So you would not have guessed that from this discussion. Now, uh, that's in, in some sense, that's a list of deplorable causes of outrage that's that says we need the tpnw more than ever don't we well you can interpret it that way but you can also say this indicates how difficult it will be to believe that the tpnw is going to actually affect determined morally disinhibited nuclear armed states um and i think there's there's a lot of cheating going on we've learned from wuhan you can't actually extract evidence from a country that doesn't want to give it um, there's a toleration for inter, uh, nuclear programs in the Middle East and elsewhere with the DPRK, and it's really only Mossad and the Israeli Air Force by illegal activity, which have eliminated nuclear weapons programs, which the IAEA just couldn't. It would have been blocked from getting into them. We've got the, the German Coalition Treaty recommitting to NATO nuclear deterrence, and worldwide we get re democratic, democratic regression and black, uh, backsliding. Um, 
and more and more autocratic su surveillance. We've talked about the lack of clear verification arrangements in the TPNW, which has still not been fixed. That structural problem goes unaddressed. But I'm going to go further. There's a lot of emphasis on emotions in inter international relations. And I think the TPNW campaign is, 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 is emotional, understandably. And I think it's an example of the emotional fallacy. We could call this the militant, the anti-genocidal mentality. It's real. It's worth respect. I'm not rubbishing it. But it's not a reliable guide to how, how things are going to work out in the wider world. There is, um, it's felt most in the weirdest countries. I'll come to weird next. Um, we but, have a few minutes, Phil. Uh, okay, we got abhorrence in uh, non-nuclear weapon states, but not, um, the, not amongst countries which have their own weapons, where these are sometimes frenziedly popular. And you've got national narcissism. I want to remind you, if there were more time, I suggest you look at the idea of moral psychologies. There are very different moral psychologies. We're all weird, westernized, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Most of the world isn't, and, and it's going to have very different attitudes. Uh, it's going to stress purity, sacredness, I, I, uh, tradition, and sacrifice. Um, you can see this in Russian statements, less so in, uh, I haven't time to look at Chinese and Indian statements, and there's an actual opposition to the idea of cosmopolitan global governance with disciplinary powers, which would be involved in, in real and effective nuclear disarmament. They, people like Dugin do not want it, and you, you would find similar statements elsewhere. If you look at game theory, it's a very discouraging incentive structure. For, fine for non-nuclear weapon states, they don't lose anything. In fact, their relative power in the world goes up. For nuclear armed uh, states and allies, then you're, you've got front-loaded costs of entry into an uncertain, destabilizing process of readjustment. Um, and you don't know how this world nuclear disarmament agent is going to go, what it will look like, how reliable it will be, doing something which has never been done. So it's only rational to sign if you think that other nuclear states can be trusted not to cheat. But why? where's the evidence for that? Um, and I just this idea of a huge shadow of Leviathans. I want to get you into the idea of the prospectively unswayable states, big, uh, non-weird, um, very economically powerful, censored, surveilled, authoritarian, or constitutionally resistant. And if you see, and, and with, yeah, the, the, all the money business as well, the producer groups, as we heard yesterday, very well. Um, so if you see those up ahead as an unpassable mountain range, why would you commit to a journey which would require you to go over them when you see no way of getting past them? So this group would be veto players in any disarmament um, endgame. And almost finally, I want to introduce this idea of nuclear regression. Regression. Um, all these uh, all these gains from TPNW and nuclear abolition, en ending the cumulative daily risk of nuclear weapons forever, are fine if it is forever. But if you have to allow for the high probability of nuclear regress regression, breakdown of what the treaty was trying to do, reconstitution races, possibly war preventative wars against rearmament, then then you've got to add in those costs as well, which are potentially huge. And I never see that, that scenario mentioned, even though it's very important. Um, and then what you have a link is a linking of the Leviathans. I, I found the Russian and Chinese ambassadors the other day saying, we together are not going to ex expect, accept interfering in, in internal affairs under any pretext. No country has the right to judge any other. So they're going to work together to stop precisely the TPNW campaign. So then we're left with this question, why isn't this being discussed? Why, why are these points not being made? I think for the, nu for the nuclear weapon states, it's diplomatically smart to keep quiet. It just pisses the NWS off. The big thing's been said, we're never going to sign. Um, and so and the Germans have handled it interestingly, because they can say, well, we will come to the, as observers, but we, we at the same yeah, time- Yeah, that's the time, Paul. So right, just okay. just well, then uh, nobody knows how to chart a route to nuclear disarmament. This is the unsayable truth, which has been said, has not been said. And I remind you of the forgotten costs of the TPNW, distraction from the harder tasks of dealing with, dealing with the indefinite, indefinite future, damaging the MPT, we've said that, and reducing our ability to criticize proliferation and irresponsible postures and deployments. If the only respectable largeship is total elimination. Then, and indeed, the British government has dropped the idea of nuclear responsibility. It's, it's no, no longer going to claim to be a responsible nuclear state. Is that a gain from the from nuclear discourse? Um, we will see. 
and so I point out how few of these arguments have been mentioned today and how few of the arguments which have been mentioned are going to matter at all to the Joint Intelligence Committees and Nuclear Command Authorities of the world. And shouldn't that matter? Just a small question. <laughs>